In a small town outside New York City, a woman vanishes. But will she ever return remains a mystery to both her family and the detectives struggling to find her. Dawn breaks at a New England hotel to reveal a body, a senseless murder, brutally committed. Any evidence left behind is scarce. And investigators must uncover clues most cannot see. A killer may strike in the middle of the night and hide clues well. But the police are always there, ready and working. And they will never give up when they're on the trail of criminals who decide it's killing time. In this episode, some of the names have been changed. In the foothills of the Catskill Mountains lies the village of Wurtsboro, New York. With a population of under 1,300, it is a quiet haven, only two hours, but a world away from New York City. On August 27, 1999, at the New York State Police Station in Wurtsboro, a call came in from out of state. The caller was Tony Valentine in Lutz, Florida. She said she was concerned about her sister, Tammy Karen. normally calls me, as I said, once a week. Valentine had not been able to contact her sister in two months, which was very unusual. She was sure something was wrong. Hey, Gil, how are you? Good. I just want to warn something by you. I just got off the phone. State police investigator John Jones learned that Tony Valentine last spoke with her sister on June 27th. She's worried because she hasn't heard from her sister, and she files a missing persons report at that time and asked us to check on the welfare of her sister. Investigators opened a missing persons case and traveled to the Karen home to see if they could find Tammy or her husband. It was possible Tammy simply wasn't returning her sister's calls. At the house, they were met by Tammy's husband. They told Hal Karen about the call from Florida, and he agreed to talk to them. He said Tammy had left him. Hal Karen uh, told me that uh, he and his wife had been having some marital problems. He said that Tammy liked to party a lot. Uh, he was giving her money on a regular basis so that she could go out. And uh, there came a point where she no longer wanted to be with Hal. Hal uh, told us that he had cut her money off, and she became upset. He said that on June 27th, they argued about her drinking and doing drugs, and he left the house to cool down. He was gone for several hours when he returned. Tammy was waiting for him in the kitchen with her bags packed. Tam! Tam! At that point, she just left the house in a small car, which she couldn't describe any further than being a small red vehicle, and that he hadn't had any contact with her since then. He did not see who was driving the car. He said she had done this before, but this time he believed she would not return. Frank, that I'll inspect you, sir. For Hal, the marriage was over. Thank you. No, As an adult, really Tammy had every right you know. to disappear. However, she still had to be found because we had a missing persons case. Uh, even though I didn't have any authority as a police officer to force her to go home or to make contact with anybody, uh, it was my responsibility to find her and report that I had found her to her parents so, or her family so that they could have some closure. 
the police ran a background check on Tammy Karen. Senior investigator Tom Scalepi reviewed the findings. The records check revealed that uh, on several occasions there were reports of domestic violence uh, in the uh, Karen household. And it was determined that Tammy was the aggressor in each and every one of those incidents. Very unusual. It's not your typical domestic violence scenario. Investigators discovered Hal had an order of protection against his wife, Tammy. They also checked Hal Karen's background. He was in the uh, Army, you know, Special Forces. No violence on his part anywhere through there. The investigators contacted Tony Valentine to fill her in. Hello, Tony. This is it appeared that her sister, Tammy, had left on her own. Talk to you maybe about that, see if we can... Tammy had called Tony and had told her that she was tired of married life and that she was leaving Hal. Maybe get some the ideas detectives from wanted to leave you. nothing unanswered, so the investigation would continue. All right, thank you. There was a lot of footwork to be done, a lot of background to be doing on Tammy. Troopers spoke to everyone who knew Tammy and followed up on even the smallest leads. She used to work here. Through the course of interviewing um, Tammy's co-workers at the uh, diner, uh, it was learned that Tammy was very friendly uh, with one of the cooks. Everyone knew the two were close. And several months before Tammy disappeared, the cook moved back to Canada. She had made comments uh, to several people that the cook liked her and that he had asked her to leave with him to go to Canada and that she was considering this as a possibility. It was a good lead, but no one knew where the cook had gone. With a subpoena, the New York State Police secured copies of the Karen's phone records. They discovered a call to a Canadian number in April of that year. Investigators needed to track down that cook. We were able to make contact with him in Canada, and we were able to put to rest that lead. He stated that he had asked her to come to Canada, and that she said she may, but that she had not returned to Canada with him. The state police distributed a missing persons flyer in the Wurtsboro area, and also in Tampa, the most likely place Tammy would have headed. We had newspaper articles, we had TV coverage, all of which generated leads. All of them, unfortunately, did not pan out. Investigators kept in contact with Tammy's worried sister. As the lead started running out, it was explained to her that, you know, with Tammy's lifestyle, there's a good possibility she might have just up and relocated, putting her past behind her. Tony insisted her sister would have called by now. That she might have gone to Canada. I, I don't believe that she would do that. But as time progressed, and it got longer and longer over the holiday seasons and uh, birthdays and special occasions, uh, it became more evident both to Tony and to uh, myself that something had happened to Tammy. All right. Investigators felt one of two things had happened to the missing woman. Either she had drifted back into a life of drug abuse, or even worse, she was no longer alive. Then, on March 25, 2002, a man driving an ATV in a heavily wooded area near Wurtsboro spotted a garbage can. It was sealed with plastic, but something was spilling out. They were bones. He went for police. New York State troopers responded and sealed off the scene. They called in the State Police Forensics Identification Unit. Leading that team was forensic investigator Miles Anthony. Uh, our agency responded to the crime scene at the base of this large inclined cliff area off the side of the west side of the highway. Uh, there was a garbage can lying on its side, which apparently had been lying there for quite a while. Uh, 
there was a black garbage bag cinched over the top of it with a uh, green cord. And it was tied with a knot uh, that looked pretty specific. The knot uh, had a, an elaborate locking loop on the one end and then a cinching system on the back side of it. It wasn't your standard knot. It appeared animals had broken through the bag and scattered the contents. At the scene, we observed the remnants of some clothing that had been on the body. There was also an engagement ring. There was a 20-inch uh, gold necklace from there, which had a pendant on it of some sort. And a watch. All appeared to be female. There was some animal activity, and they had removed some of the contents. And uh, there was a trail of skeletal remains uh, leading away from the can. All of the items were marked and collected. They hoped something there would help them identify the body. But investigators were beginning to believe that after almost three years of looking for Tammy Karen, they could now stop and start looking for her killer. In the summer of 1999, New York State Police began looking for Tammy Karen, reported missing by her sister. Two and a half years later, in the spring of 2002, they found a body in the woods of Wurzboro. Bones were discovered in a garbage can that had been secured with an unusual knot. Investigators working the Tammy Karen case believed their search was finally over. The remains were found less than two miles from her home, where she was last seen. New York State Police senior investigator Tom Scalepi. We surmised it was Tammy due to the proximity of the uh, Karen residence. The physical features are, uh, of what we could determine, hair, etc., uh, it fit the description of our victim, um, but we weren't at 100% sure. Uh, that was our main focus, is getting the remains identified. The garbage can and its contents, in addition to the rope and knot, were removed in their entirety and sent to the Forensic Investigation Center in Albany. There, examiners tried to find material in the bones from which to extract viable DNA to compare with DNA taken from Tammy Karen's family members. Assistant Director of Biological Science, Julie Pizzichetti. When you have skeletal remains, the DNA will be degraded. So with a bone and a tooth, we would actually take a drill and drill into them to get at the marrow, which is where the DNA is. We would drill into the bone or drill into the tooth and remove a portion of the marrow and transfer it into a tube and then apply uh, the chemicals that we use to separate out the DNA. After several tries, they got enough marrow to create a DNA profile. In this case, what we're doing is relational type statistics where we're comparing the relatedness of the known sample from the family member to the profile we obtained from the remains. Running the complex statistics, they got a hit. And we found that they were related, and it was actually 25,520 times more likely that they were related than not. To investigators, there was no doubt that the remains of Tammy Karen had been dumped at the bottom of a cliff. Now the question was, who put her there? Forensic investigator Miles Anthony turned to the olive green cord that had secured the plastic covering the can. The cord appeared to be military, perhaps parachute cord. The knot in the cord piqued the examiner's interest. It appeared to be unique, and I decided to maintain the knot in its original condition. New York State Police investigator Jackie Tamborello sent photos of the rope and knot to the U.S. Army to be inspected. There was an officer at West Point who immediately recognized it was a knot. 
Captain Mark Sheehan from the United States Army examined the rope. When we looked at it, and the first thing, obviously, being that it was what we label as 550 cord, obviously would initially indicate that there's probably a military link. Um, then secondary, we started looking at other things in the way it was fashioned. Uh, and that's when we picked up on the knot. It appeared that there was a bowling type knot. That indicated the killer was professionally trained. Uh, we have a seared end. And we have a configuration of multiple knots that basically turn into some type of tightening system. And in my mind at that point, this was not something that your average soldier went out and, and made. Obviously, the person that rigged this had an extensive military background, and I thought that they were either currently serving in the special operations community or probably had served in them prior to and were out. Police knew the victim's husband, Hal Karen, had been in the Army's special forces. Investigators traced the cord through its manufacturer and learned it was only shipped to a limited number of Army bases at specific times. Investigator Tom Scalepi had his team compare those times to Hal Karen's military assignment records. Coincidentally, Hal Karen was assigned to these particular army bases during that time and had access to this cord. By this time, Hal Karen had moved out of the house he once shared with Tammy. With the permission of the current resident, the forensics unit searched the place. Nothing of evidentiary value was inside. But outside, in the bushes, they found something. Miles, you want to come over here for a minute? I think we might have something here. We located a piece of the parachute cord behind the corner of the house where the garbage cans were stored. The cord appeared to be consistent with the cord that was on the can. They brought the cord from the residence and the one found with the body to the Army Research and Development Center in Natick, Massachusetts. The senior textile technologist examined both. He said they had consistent fading. They both had four strands, two light yellow, one green, and one white that completed one piece of the filament. The technologist also pointed out that the ends of both pieces of cord had been heated over a flame. They had consistent twisting qualities and consistent charring, and it was possible that they could have been one piece at one time, although he couldn't say for sure. Now, investigators hoped clues on the garbage can would identify her killer. Forensic investigator Miles Anthony could not find usable prints on the outside of the can. But Anthony noticed something the killer might not have. On the side of the trash can was a, a colored adhesive that uh, bared the name of the sanitation company that would pick up that garbage. On the back side of that sticker is an adhesive. Someone who had placed that sticker on the side of the can may have left a latent fingerprint on the adhesive side as they were applying the sticker. On the adhesive was a single latent print. Police secured copies of Hal Karen's inked fingerprints from the Army. And now they needed to find out if Tammy's husband's print matched the one found on the garbage can that contained her bones. If they did, investigators believed they were finally closing in on her killer. In 2002, in Wurtsboro, New York, state police investigators found a garbage can containing the remains of Tammy Karen who had been missing for three years. One latent print was recovered from the label on the side of the can. Investigators believed if they could identify the print, they would identify the killer. Forensic investigator Miles Anthony compared the print to that of Hal Karen, Tammy's husband. I was able to compare the two of them and match the latent fingerprint that I had gotten from the back of the adhesive to the known inked prints. It was a positive match. It was an absolute match to Hal Karen. Finally, District Attorney Stephen Lungeon had enough for an arrest warrant. 
this case came together ultimately as a result of forensic evidence and its examination. Fingerprint evidence, fiber evidence, DNA evidence. They decided to arrest the suspect away from his house in case he had weapons inside. They knew that the former army ranger was trained to kill, and they wanted to avoid a volatile situation. Officer will take care of it. Just uh, roll On August 6, 2002, New York State troopers took Hal Karen into custody without incident. I'll just put you in the front right here. 41. I do know something. At Troop F headquarters, wife, investigators I, John I, Jones I and Jackie Tamborello interviewed like Karen. Around. I still don't think you're telling us the complete truth. What I want to ask you to do is... First, he denied any knowledge of his wife's death. When confronted with the evidence linking him to the body, uh, no, he changed his story. In fact, I think I probably... In his so latest story, he describes returning home, finding Tammy Karen in the bathroom of their house, uh, sitting on the toilet with her head in the sink, uh, and appeared to have died of an overdose. Stand up, please. He said there were crack vials all around her, and he worried if he called police, he would be arrested for drugs. So he disposed of her body. The investigators needed to check the possibility of a drug overdose. We were very lucky in this case. We managed to find what turned out to be her liver. The liver is able to give us a lot of information about her blood chemistry. And we were able to utilize that to determine her, her toxicological state. Toxicologists at the Forensic Investigation Center reported slight traces of echoline, a chemical byproduct of cocaine. But the amounts indicated infrequent use, weeks or months before death. It was no overdose. Investigators believe that on June 27, 1999, the couple had argued, as Hal Karen originally stated. But during that argument, he attacked her. He probably strangled her. He knew he had to get rid of the body. It would fit in the municipal garbage can. He could seal it off with parachute cord and plastic garbage bags. He took her to the cliff a mile and a half away and dumped her. <coughs> Hal Karen was convicted of second degree murder and sentenced to 25 years to life. In New York, investigators had to navigate through lies and dead ends, revealing a brutal crime that at first seemed like no crime at all. But in Vermont, things were not so subtle. The town of Rutland is a small, working-class city nestled in a quiet valley in the heart of the state. It is the sort of place where everyone knows everyone else, and violent crime is rare. Just asleep. On April 19, 1998, Ethel Desmarais entered the Rutland Motel where her daughter Jane worked and found her lying motionless on the floor. It looked like someone had tried to burn Jane. She wasn't breathing. The motel owner called for help. Vermont 911. And the emergency operator immediately dispatched patrol officers and detectives. 5548 respond to the Rutland Inn on South Main Street. Stand up. It's Although she couldn't believe it, Mrs. Desmarais knew her daughter was dead. Detective Chris Kiefer Chaffee responded to the probable homicide. Rare, but not unheard of in the area. It happens. We're not immune from all the other types of crimes that happen everywhere else. It just doesn't happen as often, which is what we're real thankful for. 
By the time Kiefer Chaffee arrived at the motel, other investigators had secured the scene. But this case would be like no other the detective had encountered. The victim was her friend. Uh, I was advised that the night clerk had been murdered. Her name is Jane Demeray. And I know Jane. I've known Jane for years. What did you see? Investigators took preliminary statements about the discovery of the body. She had some Mrs. Demeray explained she began worrying earlier that morning when she could not get in touch with Jane. Yeah. She called the motel manager, then went to check on Jane. That's when they discovered her daughter's body. The counter, you said? The motel owner confirmed the story and said Jane was alone on duty the night before. Investigators moved inside to begin processing the crime scene. It was immediately clear to Sergeant Rod Pulsifer that someone tried to burn the body. When we came into the main lobby, she was lying on her back on the floor. There were several cans scattered around her, which appeared to be chemicals, which had been thrown on her and appeared to have been ignited. <coughs> there was um, an awful odor in the air from the chemicals and the flesh that had been burned. <coughs> Despite the gruesome nature of the scene and the victim they all knew, they had to focus. You have to stay on cue. You know that you're going to find the answer. You just have to listen to what your evidence is telling you. So you want to finish photographing the overall general scene? Yes. I started processing by photographing. You always photograph the scene first. After recording the placement of evidence, they began systematically collecting it. We had recovered some uh, pieces of paper advertisements in which there was a bloody palm print and what's called the interdigital portion of the palm. That was a significant piece of evidence. All right. Okay, you see that blood stain? Next to the body was a small blood stain, probably from the victim. I noticed that Jane had a cut on her nose. The killer might have gotten her blood on his hand then touch the paper. Hoping the killer left more traces behind, they dusted nearby surfaces for latent fingerprints. Detective Kiefer Chaffee collected the empty accelerant cans near the body, all items normally found in the janitorial closet. A can of linseed oil, wood cleaner, drain cleaner, and paint remover. They were flammable, but not combustible. So the fire was short-lived. At the front desk, the detectives the, uh, found signs of robbery. Yeah, it looks like these... Cash drawer had been opened. Some cabinet drawers in the back office area had been all opened also. Okay. From receipts, they determined roughly $500 was missing. It looked like the fire was not the cause of death. On the victim up around the neckline, there were markings that would uh, lead us to believe that she had been strangled. An autopsy would tell more. Trace evidence might have transferred onto their gloves, so investigators also placed them in the body bag for the medical examiners to check. Rutland police also needed more details from the victim's mother. Despite the unimaginable horror she experienced that morning, Mrs. Desmarais tried her best to answer all of the detective's questions. She's very punctual. We arrived at 11 and, uh, Jane's mother explained to us that uh, she dropped her daughter off there that night about 11 o'clock. <laughs> the mother came inside with Jane as she normally did. The other clerk was ready to go off shift and cashed out. He reported one noise complaint, nothing unusual. 
It was like any other night, very routine. As was their custom, mother and daughter talked for a while before Mrs. Desmarais left around 11.30. So what happened after? She said there was nothing that would explain such a horrible crime. Jane's a very docile person, hard worker, led a very simple lifestyle. To have something like this happen to somebody, uh, there was just no reason. There was just no visible reason other than um, the money that was appeared to have been taken and her maybe trying to stop them. But to go to the extent of uh, the burning uh, certainly baffled us. The autopsy was performed at the chief medical examiner's office in Burlington. It confirmed the victim had been doused with chemicals and lit on fire. Minor hemorrhages on the neck and in the whites of the eyes revealed the cause of death, according to Dr. Paul Morrow. The cause of death was asphyxia due to some form of strangulation. The examination uh, didn't reveal a, um, a specific means. It wasn't clear uh, from whether um, the assailant had used his hands or a ligature of some sort. In any case, it was a gruesome crime for this quiet New England town. At the Rutland Police Department, investigators met to review the case and plan. Most crimes in the area are solved quickly. So we're a small community, and you know your, your good guys and know your bad guys. So automatically, when something happens, you just start running a list through your head of the people in town that had the potential for doing something like this. However, uh, the circumstances in this case, uh, with the, the strangulation and then the burning, um, there was nobody that came to my mind. There were no suspects in sight, and the first crucial hours of the investigation were slipping away. That's when everything is fresh, everything is hot, and uh, that's when you get your, your best leads and gather your best evidence. Uh, Rutland police methodically interviewed everyone at the motel. I'm not sure if you saw our cruisers out in the front lot or not. Finally, but, uh, they found two guests who had a promising lead. Uh, there was a couple that came in about 11.30 that evening uh, to just check in, spend the night. When they arrived, they told us that they saw uh, a white male that was there in the lobby who had gone over and sat down in a bench uh, across from the check-in counter. They said he yeah. wore uh, blue jeans, a uh, jean coat, and a white cap. They described him as average height, medium build, with brown hair. But their encounter was brief, and they could not describe specific facial features. Rutland police immediately put out a press release with the description asking anyone with information to call it in. They had the bloody palm print and now a general description. But they always believed they would find the killer. With the team that we had working this, I, I knew we were going to solve it. It was just going to take some time. The cops of this small Vermont town would not give up. For them, it was personal. They would not stop until they found Jane's brutal killer. In 1998, night clerk Jane Desmarais was found murdered in a Rutland, Vermont motel. She had been strangled, then doused with chemicals, and investigators believed her killer had attempted to burn her. Investigators had a vague description of a man seen in the motel lobby with Jane. A description was released to the public but their best piece of evidence was a bloody palm impression recovered on a piece of paper in the lobby. Rutland detective Chris Kiefer Chaffee brought the impression to forensic laboratory specialist John Creighton. The impression on the paper was the interdigital portion of the, of the palm. And the interdigital portion is located below the fingers uh, of the palm. 
And what she had hoped that we would be able to do with this is to bring out the existing ridge detail that is there and possibly develop more of the fingers of that impression. To develop unseen fingerprints, Creighton sprayed the flyer with an anhydrin aerosol. And anhydrin is used uh, on porous items and it reacts to um, secretions from the skin, amino acids, that are soaked into the fibers of the porous material and an anhydrin reacts to those amino acids and develops a visible uh, print on that porous item. Introducing heat and steam from a household iron causes the reaction. The fingers uh, of the palm above the interdigital area were developed visibly. He could clearly make out the prints of four fingers of a right hand. But there was more. On the middle finger, he noticed an irregularity that appeared to be caused by a wart. I thought the aberration at the tip of the finger was a good additional item for identification purposes because of its uh, uniqueness. You could eliminate someone relatively quickly uh, just by keying in on that area of the finger. Now, with viable fingerprints, Detective Kiefer well, Choppy could eliminate suspects generated by the press releases. We had an awful lot of tips come in, and we were able to approach some of those people, explain to them, look, we'd like to take your fingerprints. We had some prints at the scene. We'd like to eliminate you as a suspect. And they voluntarily came in, gave us the fingerprints. But checking the prints of the people called in, as well as those of all employees and guests, was a tedious process. Back in 1998, we weren't computerized. We did not have an AFA system, which is an automated fingerprint identification system, so all of our comparisons were done by eye. So literally taking hundreds of cards and doing a comparison to what was found from the scene. Despite dozens of man hours spent checking the prints, none of them matched. It was a dead end. They needed to broaden the search. We had requested the computer database search in all of the states that were currently on an AFA system. We also went through Canada, had them do a database search, and we went through the FBI and had them do a database search. So we have literally compared millions of fingerprints, and we are not coming up with an answer. We have not come up with an identification. So that tells me this person has simply never been fingerprinted before. Five days passed with nothing solid. Then, investigators learned the motel owner's son had a possible lead. He came up with uh, Robert White, who had worked there. He'd only worked for, for about two, possibly three weeks. He'd been fired from the motel for sleeping in the lobby when he was working, really not wearing appropriate work clothes, dressed kind of shabbily, is how the owner's son put it. It wasn't much. Robert White was just a fired employee with no specific link to the crime. He, like everybody else, was put into the pot and following our methodology of, of the investigation, was put on the list to be contacted and, and interviewed. White was not home when officers checked his apartment several times, not unusual with people on investigators' lists. But he began to distinguish himself from others on the list by not returning investigators' calls. We had gone to other places. People weren't home initially, left messages, and they contacted us right away. And he was one that didn't, and that raises an eyebrow. Rutland officers traveled to Menden, Vermont, to the last motel where White was known to have worked. One of the clerks there knew White, but said he did not work there any longer. She told police White had a temper and threatened her once. She said it had happened the year before. The clerk knew White was married. One day, she confronted him about the women he often brought to the motel. 
She said White got angry and even threatened to kill her if she ever said anything about it again to anyone. The clerk believed the threat was real. Investigators needed to learn more about Robert White. They received the results of a background check on White. He had been arrested in Texas for DUI, although for some reason he had never been fingerprinted. Because database checks had come up empty, Rutland police believed their killer had never been printed. Patrol officers again went to find White. This time, he was home. Hey, yes, sir. Are you Robert White? Yes, me. And we're investigating. He fit the general description of the man seen in the lobby. Kind of doing a process of elimination. Officers explained they wanted to speak with him about the murder of Jane De Marais. Robert White admitted that he had known Jane, liked her, felt really bad for what happened, and was willing to submit fingerprints. He agreed to come with him to the station to give the prints and talk to detectives. He was following what everybody else was doing, being very cooperative and very willing to uh, assist us in any way he could. With, uh, John up at the Detective lab. Kiefer so Chaffee had eliminated countless prints up. over the previous two weeks, comparing them to the ridge pattern of the prints found at the crime scene. Because at this point, mind you, this pattern is, is like, I see it everywhere. I mean, these four fingers, I could tell you the ridge count, I could tell you the pattern, I could tell you the classification. I mean, it was like, you know, second nature at this point, because I have looked at so many friggin' fingerprints and compared them all. When she took White's prints, her knowledge paid off. I recognized the second finger that this pattern was exactly the pattern from my latents from the crime scene. So, of course, I'm now rolling finger number three. I find the wart on finger number three. She believed he was the one. I knew. I knew there was a break in my voice. I knew that my heartbeat at this point was, you know, climbing pretty quick because I'm recognizing the patterns. But I had to conceal that. I could not let him know that I was suspecting anything. While other detectives took White aside for an interview, Kiefer Chaffee did a quick visual comparison. It looked good. What I needed to do now was get these fingerprints up to John Crichton at the lab because he's certified latent print examiner and he needed to finish this. So I called John to let him know I was on my way and he dare not leave until I got there. After eliminating more than 100 suspects in the gruesome murder of Jane De Marais, police believe they finally found her killer. Now they hoped forensic experts could confirm their suspicions and provide the proof they needed to put him away forever. Two weeks after motel clerk Jane De Marais was strangled and burned during a robbery, Rutland, Vermont police took fingerprints off former motel employee Robert White. Detective Chris Kiefer Chaffee had personally eliminated more than 100 sets of prints in the case and believed she finally had the right set. When I left the office, I was 99% sure it was one and the same but I'm not qualified to do it 100%. All right. I think this is our guy. She brought the fingerprints to forensic laboratory specialist John Creighton at the Vermont State Crime Lab, who had developed the crime scene prints. And uh, he was able to make the identification. So at that point, I called back to the station, said we've got a positive ident. The detectives in Rutland received the good news while the interview was still ongoing.
Robert White was arrested and charged with the murder of Jane Desmarais. You say Cannon will be used against you for law. Yeah. Having these rights in mind. He declined further interview and requested an attorney. He was held on $250,000 bond. They would have to go to court, relying primarily on a single piece of evidence, according to Sergeant Rod Pulsifer. What I would refer to as probably the crown jewel of the, in the entire investigation was the fingerprint and the blood. Not only did the ridge detail of the fingerprints match whites, the wart on the middle finger was the same. At trial, prosecutors told the jury what they believed the crime scene evidence proved had happened on the night of April 18, 1998. There was no sign of struggle. Jane Desmarais must have known the killer. When Robert White showed up, she would not have been concerned. In fact, she had once covered for White when his cash drawer came up short. But if he took money from her drawer, Jane would have tried to stop him. Jane's body was found in the lobby. She must have confronted him there. Though he perhaps didn't intend to kill Jane, I don't believe he expected Jane to put up such a fuss. But that's Jane's personality. That's, that's Jane in and out. She's a wonderful woman, and, and she was very protective of the people that she worked for. At some point, he knocked her against a desk, causing her nose to bleed. Then he strangled her. It would have taken several horrifying moments for Jane to die. Her blood on his hand, White leaned on the flyer, leaving the print. Frantic, he got the chemicals. and dragged Jane out of view of the front door. Trying to conceal the crime, he then doused her upper body, no doubt trying to destroy evidence. He lit the fire and ran. But the fire was short-lived burning the victim's face and hands, and little else. <coughs> Robert Lloyd White was found guilty of second-degree murder. He was sentenced to life in prison with no possibility of parole. When killers strike, they leave their mark. But police are there to find it and make the criminals pay. Using hard-won experience, fierce determination, and forensic science, Investigators do everything they can to find justice for the victim and the loved ones they leave behind.